let's talk about each of these. Um, what is a graph? I guess a graph is a bunch of things. A bunch. How many points? It's true. Uh, I said a graph is x and y coordinates with infinity amount of points on it. Is that all right? A little, be a little more I said uh, the graph is um, an in, or a way that an infinite number of data can be displayed and uh, compared. Okay. That word data, a lot of people are using data. Data is a little bit tricky because when you think of data like in a science class or something, statistics class, data can be very messy. In a math class, the data that we represent is oftentimes very perfect, right? It's not so up and down and scattered. So like it follows this equation perfectly, right? So, but that's good. Like an infinite amount of points can be displayed. Yeah, a visual representation of any given set of points. Of any what? Given set of points. A uh, set of points. Like. What is a set of points? Just like? any points. Just any points. Okay. Yeah. A graph in general can be a set of any points. Um. In a, in a math class, an algebra class, these points come to us like in this perfect way, like not in a scattered way, right? Not in general, yeah, it's a bunch of points in a math class, it's a bunch of points that we get from. Where, where do these points come from? Uh, the function. The function, yeah. That's very not insignificant from the function. The function gives us. Well, how does it give us these points? Huh? Like, you uses an x and y. It uses an x and a y. So yeah. that there's an x and y involved. Uh, how would you maybe? The equation equals y or x. Equals y or x, and how do I? I need both pieces. Plug right? in the number for y or x on the yeah. other side of the equal sign. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's usually equals y, right? And you plug in x. So the, the, um, uh, each point represents the input and the output. Each point represents the input. So it's a, um, a, a specific input, output of, uh, of Which is usually an equation. 99 times out of 100, they come to us in the form of an equation. I said, like, what she said, like, uh, equation, or like, not an equation, like, coordinates. He's, he's talking about the kind of like right here? Yeah. The coordinates. Yeah, the coordinates, that's how we put the point where it's supposed to go by the coordinates. The coordinates of the point represent the input and output of the function. So I give it a specific input, it gives me that specific output. That's what each point represents. So, this is the thing that's really key that you may not realize is really, really key. Uh, particularly in a lot of the graphs that I saw on the test. Okay. If you don't know what the shape of the graph is, what that curve looks like, how do you find out what it looks like? You continue playing with different numbers of function. Right, and then you get the you get input and output, and then you have another point, and then you put input and output again, and you put input out, input in, you get output out, and you have another point, you have another point, you have another point. Remember, every point represents a specific input and output. And if I draw the graph, I'm drawing all of the points, right? Once I do that final step of drawing that curve, I'm finishing up the picture, I'm saying, here's what all the other points look like. I right? plot more points. by uh, putting in for x and getting out y. That's what we, we keep doing over and over and over. If we want to know something more about the picture, we've got some points, we're not quite sure what the curve is supposed to look like, we get some more points. And, by extension there, if I have some points, 
and I draw a curve, I'm saying that's where all of the points are going to wind up. Right? Does that make sense? All of the other points are going to wind up here. Every point represents a specific infinite output. So let me show you what I mean about um, what I was seeing on the test. So you do the table. You get all these uh, x and y values. You throw the points on there. Let's say you wind up with something like that. You should not get something like this. attention to all the stuff that we've been saying that we know is true, and if we fall back on this, we know that this can't be the case. Right. Because where did they get these points to start with? The function. From the function, right? We, we used the, the function, the equation, we found some x's and some y's, we plotted those x and y's as coordinates in the plane, and we got some points. Okay. By doing this, let me walk you through what you're saying. You're making a statement here. You're saying, I have found all of the other points, and this is what they will look like when I plot them all. Dimitri? Which wouldn't be right, because there's only, there's, you want to have kind of a, more, it's not exactly straight, but a less curve, so it's more accurate than just saying, well, if I have a giant curve, and not missing all those points, <laughs> will that go right? Yeah. Yeah. Another way to, to look at it is you can look at this guy right here. How did we get that? Again, how did we get that point? Put something in for x, you got something out for y. Right? We go over here for x, did all these calculations, and we found this y. So when we put in 1, we got out of negative 8 or something like that. Put in 1, we got out of negative 8. But look at what this graph, remember this graph is made of what? This curvy thing is made of what? How many? Infinite. Infinite number of points. Each point represents what? Uh, An input and output. Okay, so let's just go with that. So if, if, if the graph is right here, that means that I, I'm saying there's all these points, these infinite numbers of points right through here. Yeah? Okay. And so there, that right there must be a point that makes up the graph. And there's points over here and here and here and here. The important thing about this point that you're saying when you draw that curve is, when I go to 1, I will get negative 4, negative 5. Did you get negative 5 when you put it in 1? No. No, we put in 1. Let's say we got negative 8. If we did get out two things, we would have seen that happen. But we didn't. But what your graph says is, yes, you do get out two things when you go to, say, 1. Or when you go to 2, or you go to 3, or you go to 4, right? We're getting multiple outputs. Everywhere that the graph is above itself, we're getting two outputs. And if it's above itself and comes back and it's above itself again, we're saying we get three outputs for this input. But you've been working with these functions yourself. You've been plug plugging in one number, and how many numbers do you get out? What? Put in one, you get out one. Okay. Like, um, what you're saying is like, so I don't work because we have to like plot every other um, coordinates or you know like the value there is and the equation of the function that doesn't match that. So it's just from yeah, if I were to keep on plotting points and plotting points and plotting points, it would not make this shape. Yeah. For at least one reason, there's at this place and lots of other places I get this output that I that I actually did get, and then some other or output. Came. Right, you're not going to get two things out. Yeah. And if you did, you would have found that out yeah. when you plugged in one. Right? Maybe there's some weird function that actually happens or it would have happened to you. You would have done it. You would have found some other out. So what we need to do? We need to back it up. We're losing it. Okay? We have to think. 
when I draw, go to draw this curve, where will all of the other points wind up going? Right. Now, I know that if I put in one, I'll get negative eight. Let's say this looks like uh, negative two, and I get negative eight as well. They look like they're on the same y value. Well, what do you think I'll get when I plug in, say, zero? Do you get two answers when you get put zero in there? No. Well, if it's above. Oh, no. no when no, we put no, in no. zero to x, we do the, all the calculations, you know, the, and, the, and the, we put all the numbers together, we get one thing. Yeah. How big do you think that thing will be? If, if this, if it, I'm just arbitrarily saying this is negative eight. Be smaller. You think it would be further down? You think it'd be negative seven? Yeah. No, but like this. I bet it would be down here. And here's why. It kind of has to do with the, all the, uh, the rest of the graph. Look at the rest of the graph. Oh yeah, because it has to. Yeah. If if I put in this this x, I get out this y. If I put in this x, I get out this y. You gotta remember we, where we got these points. We put in a number for x, and we got out a number for y. If I put in this x, I got out this positive y. And I put in this x, I got out this negative y. I bet you somewhere in between these two x's, there's an x where if I put it into the function, I'll get out zero. That makes sense, right? Here we go, positive x, or positive y, here I get negative y. There's probably an x somewhere where I get a zero for y. And all the things to the right will be some further and further negative value for y. Every x that I move over, I'll get a further and further negative y value. This is making sense? Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. So keep getting this more and more negative. And look, I, I know that I get negative 8. I bet I'll, between here and here for x, I'll continue to get smaller and smaller numbers for y, meaning more and more negative. And I bet that trend will continue a little bit past there, but then well, I'll have to come back up to, to get to negative 8 again. And I get this point here. I bet all of the points between here and there, if I put in these x's, I'll get out y's. They gradually lead up to whatever that is, negative 5. And now I'm getting beyond the, the data that I have, or the, the points that I've plotted, okay? And I will just kind of bet that the bigger x I put in, the bigger y I'll get out. I'm just going to say from then on out, whatever x I put in bigger than that, I'll just keep getting bigger y values. Bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. That's my guess, right? But this graph, now, now when I draw this curve, I'm drawing trillions and trillions and trillions and infinite number of points right, when I draw that curve. Now it reflects more what the function will actually do. And when we say what a function will do, we mean when you put in this x, what will you get out? When you put an x slightly to the right of that, what will you get compared to what you just got? And when you put an x next to that one, what y will you get compared to the y's you didn't get? Right? And it seems like this function, if I start way over here, I'll get these big, big y values. If I start out with an x that's way back here, I'll get big y values. And if I come closer to zero, those y values will start to get smaller. And then it will go negative. And then it will bottom out somewhere down here below negative eight. And then if I continue on from there, they'll come back up again and get to be really big as I put in really big x values over here. Okay? So first one, x is 2, y is negative 3. So go to the right. 
by two, down three. That little tiny point represents that x is two and y is negative three. So there might, I'm sure there's lots of functions out there that I can put two into to get negative three out of. Yeah. Wouldn't we want to draw like a point microscopic? Because yeah. like the point that we draw is really actually trillions of points on the point. Yeah. Yeah, because um, but then we can't see it. Exactly, that's the problem. With it. <laughs> so we can see it. The point itself is infinitely small, like so small you can't zoom in on it and see it. It's smaller than an atom. It's smaller. Mentally, it's like mentally. You have to. Yes, you have I don't to. know about that. You can only envision a point in space that this this point would be. So the point exists like in the middle of this point. Yeah. Isn't that word there's a word for that called infinitesimal? Wow. Infinitesimally small? Wow. Yeah. It's a calculus word. The infinitesimal is uh, the thing that's so small that the difference between this thing and nothing is uh, in like imperceptible. You can't even perceive how what the difference between these two things is. Uh, that's a really good point. Like this point actually it's not only at 2, negative 3, is it? It's also at 1.99999 and negative 2.9999. And it exists there, too, the way we've drawn it. Well, that's just the limitation of a graph yeah, and of our human brains. Yeah. That's a really good point. Um, let's see, negative 3, negative 8. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Right there, OK, so this is A, this is B, 2, 7. And up seven, as you see, P is negative three five. five. It's just a should be a refresher. You should know how to plot points. So just yeah. like, they expect you to on the, on the test. Okay. The thing that you want to be careful about is, I think, just slow down. Slow down and think which one's x, which one's y. Is it negative? Is it positive? A lot of little. Mix-ups like that, getting x and y reversed, not making it negative when it should be negative, and vice versa. Now, we've been talking about functions, like this real general concept of a function. Okay, so real broadly, what is a function? Absolutely, you pick whatever. Now, listen, 
I want you to think less about what x and y do I need to make it equal 3. So 1 and 2, 2 and 1, 4, negative, all that kind of stuff. I want you to think, I'm going to pick an x, and I'm going to go find out what y has to be. Maybe challenge yourself and pick like negative 5 for x. And then don't just like think about it and see it, figure it out. Like, treat it like an equation. Simple equation to solve for y. Right? Put in some x's, get out some y's, get some points and plot those points. So I can see some of you probably just didn't quite understand what I was asking for, okay? Because I see a lot of uh, just thinking of pairs of numbers that add up to three, which is, of course, correct. You, you do get to What I'm asking you to think of, think of this function as a function, as a, like a venue machine. I put something in, and I get something out. I put something in, and I get something out. That's how a function um, So let's... let's do that. I'll, I'll, I will do that. I will plug in something for x, like one, okay. and I'll figure out what y. We don't want to solve for y in this case. It's plus equation, right? Yeah. How do we solve for y? Minus one to three. You, you, you guys are great. Take the thing and we do the opposite of whatever's happening to it, and then we isolate this. So we get. Uh, X and Y. Y is too big. Okay, so X is 1 and Y is 2. We solve that. What would be even easier to plug in for X? Uh, zero. I love, I love the idea of plugging in 0. And what do we get for Y when we plug in 0 for X? Okay, let me show you. Y plus, what did we just say? We're going to plug in 0 for x. Yeah. 0 there. Mm -hmm. okay. Jason wants y plus 0. Fun thing. What's 5 plus 0? 5. What's 6 plus 0? Yeah. 7 plus 0. Y plus 0. Y. Y. So on the side, we just have y <laughs> equals 3. Why would it have to be three in that case? Drew, another idea? Four. So I get four for x. Mm -hmm. Okay? Y plus four plus three. Subtract four. And y equals negative one. Do we plug stuff in for y? Yeah. Sure. I mean, that's kind of a Same thing. not the norm, but absolutely. We can plug in stuff for y. What would be easy to plug in for y? Good idea. What number would you have in mind? One. Okay, one, not bad. One plus x. So subtract one x is two. Anything easier to plug in for y? You would do that. X? You just have to switch the two and the one. Uh, oh, and y. Yes. We plug in what is that? One for y. Okay, something even easier to plug in for y. Three is easier than one. Three plus x equals three. So now it turns out x has to be zero, and I already knew that. How about if we plug in zero for y? Zero plus x equals three. So zero for x. 0 for y, 3 for x. All right, so we have quite a few ordered pairs, quite a few points we can plot. So let's point to those, or plot those points. 1, 2, 0, 3, 4, negative 1, 2, 1, and 3, 0. I plug in, I'm plugged in basically, I can think of it as x is 0, x is 1, x is 2, x is 3, x is 4, and I plug in x is a half. Yes, the answer is yes, we can. It is possible. Can I plug in x is 3 fourths? Yes. x is 2 and 7 eighths? 
Yes, anything I want to plug in for x, I can plug in for x. Mm -hmm. I don't really want to, right? Because then there's fractions, I don't really want to deal with fractions, and then I can avoid that. You know, that's not it, okay? But if I were to plot more and more and more points, then where do you think they would fall? If I, if I plugged in like a half, three fourths, one fourth, where are these points going to fall? In between. Somewhere in between these points. And generally, what kind of a shape? A line. Looks like a straight line to me. It looks like if I just keep putting in x's and getting out y's, I will, if I plot all those infinite number of points, I will get a straight line. It seems to follow this nice little pattern. It just goes down one and over one, down one and over one, down one and over one. It just keeps, it seems like it's just going to keep doing that. Every time I give x, you know, make x one more, well, I would have to be one less so that they can add up to three stuff. Okay. So it seems like it would just keep on going with this pattern. Get this line like that. Just plug anything we want in for x. Figure out what y is. Let's yes. step it up to again. Plug in some stuff for x. Get some y's. Plot those points until you think you can see what shape all of the infinite number of points would make if you were to plot all. Of them. About two, three, four, five points, whatever you think it takes, until it starts to take shape. All right. If uh, there's anybody out there who is wondering, I am trying to lead us up to slope and y intercept. So, y intercept and slope, whatever you want. But I want you to see why the first algebra teacher who thought to tell their students to plot the y-intercept and the slope did that. Why it works, okay? Shouldn't be magic. If it's magic, it's gotta stop being magic. It's gotta make sense, right? It's just a function. We plug stuff in, we get stuff out. It's that simple. Plug something in for x, get something out for y, okay? So to make things as easy as possible for us, we choose an x value that makes life easy. To make life easy is what we use is not that. Zero. <laughs> Okay, so y, we get zero for x. So it's, I can just look at it. I don't even have to write it down to make sure I do my work right. You know what I mean? It's that easy. This is zero. Minus four. Zero minus four. Minus four. What do you have? Another one. What do you, what do you got? I did seven. Seven. Who else did seven? Who else was happy with their choice of seven? Okay, everyone who chose seven was happy with it. Let's see why. This maybe we should show our work. 5 7 times 7 over 1. Minus 4. That might not seem so great, but when we multiply this together, let's just multiply straight across. You get 35 over 7. Now it's 35 over 7. 5. 5. So we made it so that when we multiply the numerators together, we can divide that numerator by 7. That's pretty great. Right? Now we don't have to deal with it common denominators and all that kind of stuff. We do 5 minus 4, and we get 1. In a whole number, out whole number. Yeah? I think 14. 14. So 5 over 7 times 14 over 1. That's 4. Well, I could multiply these across, but I know it's going to be divisible by 7, because 14 is divisible by 7, right? So let's just go ahead and do that cross-canceling thing. So that leaves us with a 2. And now it's not 5 minus 4, it's 10 minus 4. Well, it's just 5 more than the previous. That's 5 more than 5. So 10 minus 4, that's 6. That happened when we put in 14. Let's just do one more in that direction, which would be in the positive x oh. direction. Um, the next one? Wait. 21. Oh, like going on in that. Yeah, going on in the positives. We got 7, we got 14, oh. and 21, right? 5, 7 times 21 over 1 minus 4. It's going to cancel. It's going to leave 3 times 5. Notice every time we put in the next multiple of 7, we wind up with the next multiple of 5 to add on to negative 4. 15 minus 4 is 11. So we put in 21, and we got out 11. Okay, it's some pretty big numbers. Maybe we should go the other way. We should go with the negative. 
negative step A7 layer 7. It has the same factors, except for one of them is negative. The same factors as positive 7. You may know this is going to wind up being a line, but we can pretend like we don't. And, and all we're doing is plugging in values of x that make our life just easier. Right? Who wants to plug in 1 and then have 5 sevenths minus 4 and find a common denominator and do all that kind of stuff to come up with a fraction that you then have to graph? Right? No. As Dimitri already pointed out, we're already off. Like our graphs are already not completely accurate. Now we're trying to guess at where these fractions are on the graph. That would be even trickier. So let's go to negative 7. It's going to have the same effect. It's going to cancel out that denominator. We're just going to have a negative number instead. We're going to have a negative one. That's negative five. Minus four. That's negative nine. That happens when we put in negative seven. What do you think will happen if I put in negative fourteen? Negative fourteen. What's that? You get out negative six. Negative six. Follow the pattern. Like zero, negative four, right? That's just canceling this out completely, and we're just left with negative four. Then what happens when I put in negative seven? Well, I get negative one times five. So I get negative four minus five. So that's negative nine. What's going to happen when I put in negative 14? Watch this. When I cancel out this seven, I get a negative two, five times. 5 times 0, 5 times negative 1, 5 times negative 2. If I went into 21, I get 5 times negative 3. Negative 10 minus 4. Negative 14 just like we looked at. So every time I move in the negative direction for x, right, from 0 to negative 7, I go from negative 4 to negative 9. That's negative 4 minus 5 to negative 9. If I go to the next x, the next uh, multiple of 7, well, then y goes down by another 5. So let's go up in the x's. We go up 7 in the x's, we go up 5 in the y's. We go up another 7, another 5. Up another 7, another 5. That's the slope. That is the slope. That's what we're seeing in, in table form that we see on the graph. That's the pattern. We're going over this amount in the x. We go up like the same amount, like the same ratio in the y every time we move over a certain amount of x. So if I plot... This guy, the easiest one, 0, negative 4, done. Then I notice if I go over to an x of 7, that's the next place I will not have to worry about fractions. That's basically what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. Move over to x of 7, I cancel out the denominator of 7. I get 5 minus 4, that's 1. I can plot 7, 1, or I'll, I'll also notice I move over 7, I go up 5. Plus five. There we go. Move over to 14. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 more. I'm going to move up. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 more. Right. That's going to be negative 4 plus 10. Move over 7 more. Move up 5 more. I can move in the other direction. Back 7. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And we'll move down 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Move over another 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Move down another 5. One, Five. Just taking advantage of that pattern that we just noticed. Every time I move up in x's, I move up. I move over seven in the x, I move five in the y direction. Oh, that was so close. Yeah, let's fix that. So if you've ever graphed lines before, and you've gotten in the habit of doing y intercept and slope. This is why. This is how come we do that. But it's it's not that we just connect two un previously unconnected points. These points are connected by a bunch of other points. And that's what we're drawing when you draw that line. It's just that we don't want to bother with the ones in the middle. Why don't we want to bother with these points in the middle of these two points? There's too many of them to, to plot, right? There's physically too many. What could we say about all these points? points in between. Why was this point so easy to find? So multiple of seven, what did we drew? Because we know the pattern. Pattern. If I put an x that's between zero and seven, I'm going to get a fraction for y, right? I'm going to get a 
fraction of y. That's why you don't want to mess with those points in between. When I move over to 7, that is the first point, the first x value that makes it so I don't have to mess around with fractions, finding common denominators, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Let's talk about what values of x are the easiest values of x, Drew. Uh, 10 and 15 and 20. 10 and 15 and 20 and uh, 5 and what? Zero. And 5 and 0. I like 0 the most, of course. Right. 0 is so simple. This is where we get the idea of, of finding the y-intercept, right? Because if my equation looks like this, whenever I plug in 0, I will always get this as the leftovers, right? This as y. Yeah. So there's a thing we call the y-intercept. If you've ever graphed a line before and you just put a point up there on y is 7, you have an idea of why you do that. Not just because the 7 is there, but because if you put in 0 for x, you got the 7 of y. Okay? So the next smallest number that would be very easy to plug in for x. Five. Five. Very, very simple. Plug in five for, for x, I mean, negative three fifths times five over one, seven. Get the cancellation of five. We get a negative three plus seven. And four. Four plug in x is five. So nice. Like if we were to choose one or two or three or four, we would have to worry about this denominator of five, and we'd have to find common denominators, and we'd have to add them together, and in the end, the answer would be some fraction. So when I plug in 5, when I go over 5, I subtract 4, so I subtract 3 from 7, subtract 3, boom, over 5 and down 3, but I go over another 5, but you all go down another 3, let's find out, if I go over another 5, that's 10, negative 3 fifths times 10 over 1, and so we got 2, negative 3 times 2 is negative 6. If that is, minus another 3, right? Because this was negative 3 plus 7. This is negative 6 plus 7. That's minus another 3 compared to that, that other y value. So 10, comma, 1. Just like I predicted, just following that pattern. Right? If we were to go in the negative x's, well, now we've got this negative fraction times a negative. We'll get positive. We'll start adding numbers to 7. Five, negative 5. Here, let's just change this around a little bit. We put a negative right there. That's negative 3 times negative 1. Right? The thugs cancel. They're left with a negative 1. That's positive 3 plus 7. And that's 10. So when you put a negative 5, you get out 10. What do you think? Do we need more points to get an idea of what this graph looks like? No. I think it's a line. You're thoroughly convinced it's a line? Yeah. Yeah, we, we've got four points. The odds that you would pick four random points, and that they would be in a straight diagonal line like this, not very good. Right. If the graph was actually supposed to be some curvy thing, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That you would pick three, four random points, and they would all be on the same line, it's not, a, not very good. If this line, if this thing was actually supposed to be a curvy thing. Odds are, it's actually a straight line if we were plot all of the points. Right. Plotting them, plotting them, plotting them. Yeah, we do the straight line. So, in general, we could uh, generalize this. To whenever your equation of a, well, whatever the equation is, it looks like this. Well, I'll always get B when I put in what for X? Um, zero. 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 You put in zero for X, you just get that thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just get B. Everybody following? Yes. Well, so Y and X are, are the variables, Y and X, like you see here. 
Now M and B stand for some number, like actual numbers oh, oh, that sit okay. there. Okay. So in this case, in this case, M is negative three fifths and B is seven. In this case, right here, M is five sevenths and B is four. And we'll always get that B, whatever's in the B place, when we plug in zero for X. Whenever we plug zero in for here, we just get B out here. So we know there's going to be a point at zero, zero B. Every time. Every time. Drew? Um, could be any. Why, why is it B and M? That's, that can't be anything, though? Could be any letters? Yeah. It could be any letters. Now, worldwide, mm -hmm. we use M and B. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, so, you got me on why it's M and B. It probably goes back to some Greek or Latin root. I don't know why. All right. But it's, it's a good question. Huh? Maybe, yeah, maybe somebody had some affinity for M and B and they just love them. Um, Michael Bolton. Okay, and then we know this guy right here, like whatever this M is, we want to plug in X values that are multiples of the derivative of this, or not the derivative, the denominator. In this case, we're going to plug in fives. Plug in five for x, five for x, five. We're going to move over in fives. Okay? And then we'll move up and down whatever the numerator is. Yeah? Does that make sense? Am I teaching this well? Are you good? Oh, that's like a little trick. Yes, it's like a little trick. So m is what we call the slope. We call it our rise over run. Now the run comes about because we want to move over in x units that are equal to whatever this number is. Because if we do that, then the input-output thing is much easier. So we can look at it here. The, the, the b is 7. Why? Because when we plug in 0 for x, we get out 7 for y. So we know that that point is on the y-axis, right? This is also what we call the y Why do we have this rise over run? Why don't we go down three into the right five, down three into the right five? Because I want to go to the right five. I don't want to go to the right two or three or four. I could, but then what happens? I get these fractions that I have to deal with, common denominators, and not that we should be intimidated by that, but we can make the work easier by going over, in this case, fives. Go over five, and every time you go over five, you're going to subtract Three. Go over five, subtract another three. Go over five, subtract another three. Okay, from that starting point, from, from seven in this case. We go back here. All right, we got a point at zero, negative four. Because we plug in zero for x, we're going to get negative four. Of course we are. And every time we move over seven, okay, that's going to be the next easiest value of x. We move over seven, there's our run there. And we go up five. We go to the right seven and up five, just like that slope says five, seven. Right seven and up five. Okay, so let's use that little trick to our advantage. Not in the way that we use tricks because we don't understand what's going on, but because we do understand what's going on and we are shortcutting it because we are so clever. Now I'll go the other way, I'll show you the trick, and then uh, show you again why the trick isn't working. So we've got this y intercept at positive 6. function. It's just a graph of the function. Input and output. 
What do I input to get this y intersect? Zero. Zero for x, right? Zero for x gives me six for y. This is just the point of zero, six. Mm -hmm. What's up with this over three and down four stuff? Well, y over three. Why to the right three y? X is three. Because the denominator is three. Because the denominator is three. So what happens when I choose a, a three for x? The denominators cancel. And x is that. That's why we move over three. So I don't move over two or five or three. Because an x of three or an x that is a multiple of three will cancel out that three. Now we're at negative four plus six, and we get two. All right. No surprise there. Three comma two. Go over another three. Well, that's x is six. Negative four over three times six. One plus six. Cancel. Got a two there. Now it's negative four. Not just negative four, but negative four times two. Negative eight. Well, that's just six minus four minus another four, right? Starting at six, down four, down another four. Subtracting eight, we're down at negative two. Six, negative two. Moving over the amount of the denominator because that's those are the values of x that will cancel the denominator. Mm -hmm. Now we're moving up and down the amount of the numerator because that's what's left. We're going to cancel out that denominator. Either that either we're left with a numerator or a multiple. one more like that. All right, so once again, using the trick, we're recognizing that this is something called slope-intercept form. And we're talking about what's behind it. Okay. The trick is what it is. So we have this negative 5, so that's going to give us our y-intercept. Four, five, right there. Move to the right three and up seven. So to right three and up seven. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven from negative five. Oh, oh. Because when we go over to three, let's, let's see. When we go to x is three. Notice what we're doing. We get the threes to cancel. Oh, okay. We're adding seven to negative five. Okay. So, I get it now. so that's it's not exactly a starting point because lines, graphs, and things for the most part are infinite. But on the y-axis, can be thought of as we start at negative five, we go up seven, we go up seven more, up seven more every time we go over three. Yeah. What if it isn't three though? Like what else would it be? X. What's that? Like the x, what, what if it isn't three? Or like four. So, so that three is four? Like four or something. Yeah. In, this, in this equation? Yes. Specifically this equation. Well then it just well, becomes... I'm, I'm just saying, like what if it's something different? Than well you mean, not is x... But we want to leave the 7 thirds, is what you're saying. Uh, yeah. Like, yes. Well, I was just saying, like, what if yeah. the x is like, like, Like it doesn't match the denominator? Yeah. OK. In that case, it's just more work, okay. right? There definitely is a point there. There is a, that, like, we can't plug that in. So let's see what happens. y equals 7 thirds times 4 over 1 minus 5. Okay. The reason why we move over 3 is just because it's easier but if we do this, we'll get 28 thirds minus 5. OK, well, we need to make this 15 thirds, right? We need a common denominator. Multiply by 3 over 3, we get 15 over 3. And 28 over 3 minus 15 over 3 will be 13 over 3. Right? Yeah. So we get this point 4 and 13 thirds. So what happens? We get a fraction. Which is not the end of the world. But let's see what it takes to graph that guy. So we go to 4, and we go to 13 thirds. So that's
that's going to be, let's see, it's uh, uh, three thirds, uh, six thirds, or, or uh, nine thirds, 12 thirds, 13 thirds, so four and a third. So it's just like when we graph it, it's just more guesswork. It's less, you know, less accurate than our graph already is. Uh, but certainly, it's valid. We do get an output. And if we move over in threes, if we put in x's that are threes, multiples of threes, then we don't have to deal with a fraction. And that's the whole point. That's the rise over run idea. That's why we use the slope, because the slope plays on numbers that are right on the grid. So again, we can generally, if we have m, x plus b, then that could be our y-intercept, and that can be our slope. That can be our rise over run. Rise being the vertical, and run being the horizontal. If we go up or down this much, depending on if it's positive or negative, we go uh, right or left this much, depending on if we treat it as positive or negative. Something about a negative slope, real quick. We have y equals 4 uh, times x plus 2. Negative, sorry. Well, we can get the y-intercept of 2. If there's ever any doubt, if you're like, well, I don't really know what's going on here. I don't know how I'm supposed to treat the slope. Just start plugging in values for x and getting points if you're not quite sure. But if we're asking ourselves, is this negative 4 over 9, or is this 4 over negative 9? You get a pick, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Negative 4 over 9 is a negative number, right? Negative 4 divided by positive 9 is negative 4 ninths. Now, 4 divided by negative 9, four, positive 4 divided by negative 9 is, again, negative 4 ninths. They're both negative numbers, they're both equivalent. So, whether I think of this as a rise of negative 4, meaning 1, 2, 3, 4 in the negative direction, and over 9 to the right. Okay, that would be like that guy. Or, like this, up four, and to the left nine. It's the same. What's it look like? It makes the line. Okay, here we go. Okay. And even with a positive slope, down 5 and to the left 11. Still, down 5 and to the left 11. Viewed this way, it's positive 5 over positive 11. Viewed going this way, it's negative 5 over negative 11. But what's a negative divided by a negative? Positive. Positive, so it's the same thing. Positive 5 over 11. Okay, well, I'll cut it up there. I'm going to...